Okay. Hello, this is, I'm Benjamin Lungwitz, and I want to talk about um, financial modeling, uh, namely market risk modeling um, with Pluto, with Julia, and with Pluto. Um, why Julia for that purpose? Julia is combining the, the productivity, the developer productivity of languages like Python um, with, the, um, with the numerical runtime performance of uh, languages like C and market risk calculation is something which usually takes quite a lot of, uh, re of computational resources. And as an additional benefit, uh, Pluto allows um, a very, very nice and easy um, creation of GUIs for visualization of the results. Okay, what I have here, um, the first we define a bunch of traits and um, this is a, pro a small prototype. Therefore, I'm just taking a rather simple product, namely a cache settle fx forward and fx forward is a product where you where you say like you say today i exchange in one month uh, 1 million euro against something like 1.2 or 1.1 million us dollar that means you're fixing the rates today and you're exchanging at a specific date in the future and to make it e more easy even more easy to model i assume that it is some kind of cash settlement that means the uh, Settlement cash flow in the end is uh, is the difference of the FX rates which you agree today minus the FX rate it will be in the end um, multiplied by the notional. Um, for financial products, usually you say you use the concept of a present value. The present value is the um, essentially how much worth is that contract today, and this is usually. Um, yeah, this is calculated by discounting of the expected cash flows. That means you have uh, some kind of um, an FX forward curve, which is the market expectation or the, yeah, the it, it's constructed from currently traded FX forwards. And you use that curve to interpolate to your specific maturity. And um, this you're using to calculate your expected cash flow and you're discounting it. Um, with your discount curve to the present date. This gives you the present value. I think it's, if you're not too familiar with these uh, concepts, it's not a problem, then um, you will just see some nice plots. Uh, but yeah, this is a general concept of it. And what I now have, I define a portfolio. And this portfolio here consists of um, five different FX forward trades with with a notional, with a settlement currency that is then just the other currency and a FX forward rate, a con this one here, the contractual FX rate and a maturity here, I can say it in, in months or in days or in years. And when I now just, um, this portfolio is just an array of trades. I can also here just like, um, I don't want to have, that trade, for example, then I can just delete it and I can just play around with a fit here. And um, of course, because it's Pluto, it's it's uh, updating everything. What we have here, um, in principle, this approach could be generalized to contain multiple, um, yeah, also completely different product. Like you could put, put some cross currency swaps or interest rate swaps or, whatever other financial products in here, but uh, for simplicity for that prototype, I only implemented a very simple product. Um, what you see here is the, the time series, like we have market data from 2005 to yeah, more or less today, um, 2021. And what you can see is that the different rates change their value and here the, the um, Brown one is the sum of all. And you can see like here in the financial crisis, there were, were quite large jumps. Um, then it got a little bit calmer. Um, and here in the very end is uh, there again, a bit larger jumps uh, for the Corona crisis, which are unfortunately hidden by the legend. Um, this is how you would um, then evaluate 
the, um, the price they trade, the trade time series. And the question is, what is the market risk of that portfolio market risk? Um, one very, um, the most, I would say, the, probably the most common classical measure of market risk is the so-called value at risk. And this is defined as the maximum loss a portfolio does not exceed in a given time horizon with a given confidence level. Uh, usually you take something like a value at risk for a 99% confidence level. That means your probability is only 1% that your loss is larger than the value at risk. Um, for the time horizons, you usually take something like one business day or five business days, th that means a week. Um, for example, if you have the five different day, uh, five business day value at risk with a 99% uh, confidence level of 1 million euro, that means in only 1% of the cases, you're losing more than 1 million euro in a week. And, uh, because it's Pluto, we can, of course, uh, put it in sliders and play around a bit. Um, and this is the definition of a value at risk. And there are different methods how you can calculate the value at risk. A very simple or the most simple and also the most commonly used method in financial industry is the so-called historical simulation. There is there you just um, when you want to calculate the value at risk now, you just take uh, a history of market data returns. That means changes of market data from day to day or from T to T plus one, uh, T, T plus N, if you have time horizons larger than a business day, and you apply these historical changes to your current value of the market data. That means if your current FX rate is um, two and you had observed historically a change from one to 1.2, you apply that change when you do it relatively, uh, you would shift the current value up by tw by 20%. Um, that means your scenario would be um, an FX rate of 2.4. Um, this, of course, here has a period, uh, the parameter of the look back period, which is often set to one year, namely 250 business days. And you can here in this prototype, it's calculates the value at risk for this portfolio. Here you can just say, okay, these are the, um, the value at risks for the single trades. They're all given in, in the trade currency and it's also calculating here a value at risk for the, um, for the whole portfolio. And you can here select um, different calculation dates like this one, like when we take a date in end of, Mar uh, it's, okay, when you take them a date of end of 2008, uh, probably the values yeah, somewhere, somewhere here should be larger, right? Because that was uh, yeah, in the financial crisis. And we can also play around with, with the time horizon. Like if we have, um, here we have nine, 940, if we increase the time horizon to two business days, um, you would naively expect something like a factor of square root of two more. And yeah, it's a little bit less than a factor of square root of two. And you can also play around with the confidence level. If you have it to 99.5%, then your uh, probability that your loss is larger than this value at risk value is only 0.5%. But on the flip side, the value at risk number is, uh, is higher. Okay. Okay, um, now you could ask, uh, how good is our model? Because we are calculating just some risk measures and how, how can we know if a risk measure is good or not good? And uh, for that, there is a method so-called backtesting. That means you're not calculating value at risk only for one day, but you're calculating it for a very long time series here. Um, something like from 2008 to 2020, you're calculating the value risk for every day and you're comparing it with the realized PL. That means for each day, um, for example, for today, you would calculate the value risk based on market data 
which you know today. That means market data of the past, and you compare it um, to the PNL from today to tomorrow. And um, you would expect that only for a value at risk confidence level of 99%, you would expect that only 1% um, of the historical dates have a loss larger than this um, value at risk. And um, in order to quantify it a bit better, because you the um, backtesting time series is not infinite, but limited, you could use uh, in, um, chi chi square hypothesis test, um, the so-called qubit POF test. This gives you um, um, chi square probability. And this one you could uh, categorize. You could say, OK, it's everything green. If um, the probability of a level two error, that means um, to reject the model based on the observation is um, smaller than uh, 5%. And if it's smaller than 0.01%, you can say this is red. Of course, these numbers are quite arbitrary, but they're also um, yeah, um, given by the Basel banking regulation for that purpose. Um, yeah, what you can do here, because uh, it's everything based in Julia, you may have noticed that I ticked the checkbox about half a minute ago, and it took only half a minute to do this whole back testing on my um, laptop. It calculates for this portfolio margins from 2005 until, or PLs from 2005 until today, and margins from something like 2006. And it, the red, the um, blue line is a value at risk, and the red line is the back testing PL. And what you see is when red is over blue, that is an outlier. That means um, these are the events where the uh, loss was larger than, than the value at risk. And you can do the statistical analysis. You see um, you have, um, this is the number of points and you have 35 outliers. Oh, and your traffic light is yellow because you have a bit more outliers than expected. Um, yeah, if we have yellow or green, depends on the choice of the parameters, of course. Uh, what I had done in the last time was uh, when you, for example, um, what you see also on the, on, the web, on the static website, when you use the parameter 0 0.99 and one business day, then the model gives a green traffic light, which you will see in 30 seconds. Um, but this also shows that this very, very simple um, value at risk model of a historical simulation is, yeah, it's, it's not the best model, actually. There are better models outside and more complicated models outside, uh, which um, show more reliable, good, uh, reliably good, good performance in the backtesting analysis. OK, um, yeah, that was it from my side. Uh, just to comment how it is implemented. Um, what is really, what I found really good is um, you could very nicely work with custom data types in Julia, like this um, currency amount data type uh, that has a number together with uh, a unit. And this unit is purely in the type system. That means uh, this unit um, does not have any performance impacts. And you could, it, uh, could use it to safely convert currencies without max, um, messing up the, the order and the dimensions. Uh, this was really useful. And yeah, also I implemented a, on inter, based on interpolations, a small, um, yeah, a small package where you can add curves and interpolate on market data curves. And these were very, very useful for that purpose. Okay, then thank you very much. And um, do you have any questions? Uh, the, uh, I just see the analysis is ready and, oh, it's, it's still yellow. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so a question for you would be, how did you do that table of contents and variety? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is, uh, yeah, this, this is a functionality of Pluto UI from Fonts. It's essentially just that statement here. Table it's of 
from Blue to UI, and then it, yeah. it inserts them automatically. And technically, fonts can say more to it. It's not for me. It's it, it was contributed to Blue UI uh, by someone on GitHub. So thank you ah. to who made the table of contents. Ah, okay, cool. Yay. Uh, cool. So uh, one more question. Uh, mm -hmm. How has using Pluto uh, changed your workflow? Uh, um, yeah, I think there are, yeah, um, good question. Let me quickly think about that. I think what, what I find really useful is that you com can combine Pluto with Revise. That means if you're putting using revise in a Pluto cell and then working on a package, like you're you're working in uh, VS Code on a package and you're changing something and saving it, and uh, then the updated package is readily available in, directly in Pluto, and this you can use to um, simultaneously test and play around with a package you're just developing in Pluto, and um, yeah, then based on the feedbacks you get from Pluto, you can just uh, continue working on your package and um, changing and correcting stuff. I think this is a very, very nice workflow. And I think yeah. tomorrow is also a talk of uh, Sebastian uh, regarding VS Code integration I've seen. Looking forward to that. Yeah, that's very cool. Is there something you feel like you would uh, like to see in Pluto, though? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. If you, for example, have Pluto in a window of VS Code or, yeah, um, let's see, I think that would be quite good. That's right. So tomorrow, Sebastian Fitzner is giving a talk about notebooks mm -hmm. in VS Code. And so it will be both Jupyter and Pluto, I think, but we'll learn more tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, one question for me is he talked about package development and you use revise, which means that. Mm -hmm. You can change your package code and then rerun your notebook. Mm -hmm. Do you think what, what do you think the next steps could be for Pluto? So now revise mm -hmm. works, but um, how how can we make it even better to develop a package? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one one possibility. I haven't tried it by myself, but I've seen that like uh, parts of Pluto itself or, or Pluto UI are already developed um, directly in Pluto by um, yeah programming in Pluto and then uh, just importing or including the GL files, the notebook GL files. Um, mm. But it's actually a workflow I haven't tested yet, I have to say. That's right. So part of Pluto's source code is written in Pluto, which is cool. Um, mm. And we are thinking a lot about how this can be improved. So <clears throat> like a really basic example is if you write all of your tests, then mm. uh, and you change some of your codes, and it's all in the same notebook, and only the tests that need rerun will rerun. <clears throat> so instead of rerunning your whole test suite, you can reactively only run parts of it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Um, thank you, Benjamin. Uh, thank you for your talk. You're giving another talk. <clears throat> You're giving another talk tomorrow about mm -hmm. the execution barrier. Uh, next, let's go to Paul about uh, meta programming. Mm -hmm. 